Evening, Hare Krishna. <coughs> Welcome back to the Atma Paradigm. We're now starting uh, part four of our series, uh, which is the subject matter of the universe and beyond. We've completed three out of four parts so far, and through them we've been able to establish many important kind of principles about existence, reality, and life from both the philosophical and the scientific perspectives. Now, in some ways we have addressed many issues, problems and questions that have plagued philosophy and science for millennia. But our propositions have also opened other questions that need to be addressed. Now, because there may be seeming contradictions, or not because there should be any contradictions, but because we need to step back and take a broader view of what we call reality. And that's where we're going to go to answer these questions. We hope in these forthcoming sessions of this final part of the series, we're off to explore the universe and beyond. Now, to prepare us for this journey, I'd like to use today to reiterate some of the key points we've established so far, particularly points that will help us make sense of and resolve some of the mysteries of the cosmos. Humans are very different in many, many respects. But something that we may have all done at some point or other is to look up at the sky and wonder, what's it all about? How is it that I experience myself as alive, as sentient, as aware of my own existence? What is that sort of thing we call existence? Where am I? What is this reality all around me? Where did it come from? Is there more that I cannot see? And what was there before all of that? And what came before that? Where does reality begin or end? Now, we summarise this yearning for answers into the four big questions that we talked about right at the beginning of our series. Consciousness, what makes me conscious? What is matter and reality? What is the phenomenon of life? And what is this universe in which all of this is happening to us? We recognise that scientific inquiry seeks to address those questions and to some extent has been highly effective in uncovering incredible knowledge that human society has now engaged in developing technology, medicine and the material quality of life. But to gain precision and certainty in its findings, the scientific method has traded the scope of its ability to address uh, reality in each of these quadrants for um, a lack of scope. So in each of these quadrants, science has its limitations. And we, can, we have a choice then. Do we accept that we will only know what is within the limitations of the scientific inquiry? Are we going to say that the scientific method is the only method, only process for gaining knowledge? Well, in which case, humans will never know, never get a glimpse of what is beyond the red hexagon in our diagram? Or should we extend our understanding of reality through the application of sound philosophy? And this is the role of the Atma paradigm, to encompass the big questions, not to be limited within them, and to build our knowledge and evidence that we have, build on it in using strict philosophical logic, analysis and propositions. In this, in, and we're doing this in a way that is faithful and consistent with accepted findings in science. We're not arguing against them. So what the Atma paradigm does challenge, though, are speculations which pose a scientific theory. Speculations which either have no grounding in scientific actual evidence or are derived from evidence using faulty inference, faulty logic. So, yes, be prepared, we're offering an alternative, perhaps a radically different perspective than is offered within textbooks and popular publications. The first departure from the norm is that our study of existence begins with yourself. All methods for you and I to acquire knowledge start with ourselves as sentient beings, particularly our ability to ask questions, to analyse, to observe, to learn from others, to cogitate and then to assimilate <clears throat> that knowledge. It's therefore crucial that we understand this wonderful phenomenon that is at the heart of all those processes, the phenomenon we call consciousness, which is why part one of our series focused on that question. 
So what do we mean by consciousness? There are no standards or accepted definitions of what consciousness is. But because it is something we all have and can think about, there may be certain aspects of what it is like to be conscious that pretty well all of us can be sure of and we can agree on. And we call such ideas pre-philosophical intuitions. Why pre-philosophical? Because we don't argue in order to establish them. These are axiomatic premises accepted as self-evident truths and they become the starting point from which philosophy can then build and progress. So <clears throat> see if you can go along with these points as a starting point for your understanding of existence. The first one, I exist. Each one of us thinks I exist. That means, I'm not saying you think I exist, you may not or may not, but you believe that you exist. And why do we accept that? Because I feel stuff, I experience things, I am the entity considering this question of my existence. And I am the witness. As the conscious entity, I am the witness of my thoughts in my mind and the actions of my body. I'm aware of all the things floating around in my head. And when I think about my body and how it moves and does things, I witness my actions. And of course, from my senses, I pick up information from the world around. So, and I'm also the subject, the first person subject, the I of all my conscious perceptions. <clears throat> I am the observer, I am the thinker. I think, I observe, I see, I experience. I am the person who remembers my memories, I remember. And I am the persistent subject of my experiences throughout my life. Of course, there's lots of aspects about myself that have changed over time. My body, my personality, my outlook, my interest, and so on. But despite all those variables, <clears throat> I remain, remain the same. I am the same subject experiencer who has experienced all my experiences throughout my whole life. And there's a fifth. I aspire for enjoyment, or at least I can say, or we can all say, I aspire for pleasurable or favourable states of mind and experience. Now, perhaps we all know someone who's only happy when they're miserable, but even they fit this principle. So think about these five intuitions. One or more of them may not be true, who knows, which these are our starting points. But if you think any of them may not be true, what are you suggesting should take their place as the basis, as the self-evident truth on which to build philosophy? Are you saying that um, I don't experience that I exist? No, that's... Or that I don't experience myself as the witness of my thoughts or as the subject? So these are epistemological axioms upon which philosophical and scientific research should be built. And they can be summarized into three key features of consciousness. And these were given by philosopher John Searle. And he claimed that any theory uh, or explanation of consciousness must include these three aspects. The aspects of a sense of our unified consciousness, that I am the sole, the singular, the unchanging, complete conscious entity that subjective, subjectivity, that I and the subject having experiences. And he introduced one that we haven't already talked about, which is that our consciousness is qualitative. Qualitative means that my mental experiences have qualities. Now, this is a tricky one. When my eyes gather light from my surroundings, I see that as an image in my mind. My mental experience of the scene around me has its own internal mental qualities of shapes, colours and movement which are present within my mind and make up my conscious experience of the imagery of what I'm seeing. Now these three factors, unified, subjective and qualitative, make up the issue that is called the hard problem of consciousness. And we discussed this quite a bit in detail in part one. Why the brain model has so far failed to explain the nature of conscious experience and why for many it will never be able to explain consciousness. 
It isn't just a lack of our uh, information or our research. There's a fundamental problem that exists that means that we will never be able to explain consciousness purely in terms of what the brain does. And let me take you through that quite quickly. In part one, we showed an image devised by Christoph Koch, who worked with Francis Crick on a neuroscience theory of consciousness. This is part of the image, and it shows how the eye receives light from the scene in the park. There's a man walking his dog. And this light is converted into biochemical electrical signals, which travel from the eye into the back of the brain. And there, those signals are shown as a set of electrical uh, signals or activity amongst a group of neurons. And the information then in the brain is shown now as a digitalized batch of data. So there it is. But that's not how we experience that data. Our experience of what's going on is I see a picture of the dog and the man in that scene, as shown here by Christoph Koch. This is the big mystery. My brain has data in the form of electricity, but I experience that data as an image in the format of a picture. And that picture has its own qualities. It's got shapes. It's got colours in motion. But where am I getting this from? The brain doesn't have it. Yes, there's a very nice picturesque scene outside of my body in the park, and light is coming into my eyes, but after that, all my brain has is just electrical data. So why am I experiencing it as a picture? So these qualities of our inner experiences are called qualia, and they include experiences we have from all the different forms of sensory perceptions. When we put nice things into our mouth, we experience the qualia of flavours. When we put flowers of perfume to our nose, we experience the qualia of fragrance. And things go in our ears, we experience the qualia of sounds. So sensory qualities are one type of qualia. There are others. The experiences of internal sensations like hunger, thirst, pain, or emotions like fear, happiness, excitement, plus all the qualitative experiences that we have when we experience our thoughts and memories. Now, this is a phenomenon that has proved impossible to resolve in relationship to what the brain can do. That's why the reality of qualia, these internal uh, qualities of our experience, are considered by many to be require a completely different cause and explanation than simply saying it's coming from the brain. Qualia are psychological in nature. They cannot be broken down, reduced or explained in terms of the properties of physics or anything we know going on in the brain. They are so fundamentally distinct from all of that. They belong in their own category. This is the scientific and philosophical evidence that the Atma paradigm relies on to propose that the mind and its content of qualia is a form of reality, or at least a, func a, a functional aspect of reality that is distinct from neural properties. Qualia and the mind has its own fundamental set of properties, distinct from all the properties that we have currently assigned to physics. Now there's clearly a relationship, an interaction between the mind and the brain. But the functions of each and the format by which they hold information are fundamentally different. The firing of brain cells might correlate with a thought or a feeling in the mind, but the format of that data within the brain is different. In the brain, it's simply just electrical signals. In the mind, they're present as qualia. But we can go further, because so far this only tells me about what I am experiencing as qualia in my mind. But where is the me? Where is the I, the person who is doing the experiencing of that qualia? And again, there's nothing in the brain, nor the non-neural mind to account for this sense of being the conscious experiencer. And that has led some people to suggest that if we cannot find consciousness in the brain or even in the mind, 
it must not exist. That's a, that's a pretty ridiculous thing and completely goes against what we originally know. My consciousness exists. Now, that's why we have our established premises. I do exist. I am the experiencer. I am real. And that reality of our existence has to be included within a picture of existence as the conscious observer. We have to include the reality of the observer, of the conscious entity. And that is why we have to postulate the presence of a witness to the impressions and sensations of our mind. Now, this is a very simple proposition. It's the same, um, it's fulfilled even by you sitting in front of your screen at this very moment, your computer, your tablet, your phone, whatever you're watching at this moment. That device is gathering data, but you cannot comprehend that data in its electrical format in the processor of that device. You require that information to be taken and presented on some kind of interface like a screen, taking that encoded data and converting it into a qualitative image, a picture with images and words that you can experience. So the entity that is then experiencing that information on the screen of consciousness, we call that the conscious entity, the Atma. Now, we use this word Atma, it's a, the title of our whole uh, webinar thesis. It's a Sanskrit word, word and it's chosen because of its particular precision. It defines the smallest unit of consciousness and it sees consciousness as a fundamental aspect or component of reality, but it has its fundamental or elementary unit, which is the Atma. So, the Atma is the entity that is composed of and possesses a quantum of the property of consciousness. It is the individual that each of us identify as our own conscious self. The Atma is the me that has subjective experience. It is me, the seer, the witness, the observer, the experiencer. Now, if you have any doubt about any of these points, I would suggest go back over the whole of part one, or if this is your first intro to the Atma paradigm, then definitely do it, because it is fundamental to our progression that we understand this distinct nature of both the nature of consciousness and the nature of the mind. And by understanding that principle, that both consciousness and the mind are distinct functions or components of reality, we now are in a better position to actually approach and consider what is the nature of matter and the bigger picture reality. Now, we tend to assume that matter, the hard stuff we see around us, is the real world. Our thoughts and emotions and consciousness, maybe they're just ephemeral, you can't touch them, I can't wait, I can't measure them. You know, they seem so much less real than physical things. Now, that might have been a reasonable point way back in the 1800s. But our concept of matter and reality has been pretty well upturned by the physics of the 20th century. And these discoveries of the 20th century hint at a truth underlying matter and reality. But because there's still a little resistance to acknowledging the co-existing fundamental natures of consciousness and mind along with the physical stuff, and because we don't understand the nature of consciousness and the mind, we have a kind of, we still believe that matter is a mystery and mind and consciousness are also mysteries. Now, what we need to do is have a little look at what we think matter is made of. And we're taught in school that matter is the hard stuff, that everything that we know, that makes up our bodies, the buildings, the furniture around us, the land, the trees, and the creepy crawlies outside um, our homes, and the mountains, seas, the core of the planet, and everything else in the observable universe. They're all made up of atoms and molecules. And inside these atoms are smaller particles, you know, that make up the nucleus, the nucleons, the protons and neutrons. And even these 
kind of particles of the nucleus um, are composed of smaller things like quarks, three quarks with some gluons holding them together. And then, of course, there's the electrons surrounding the nucleus. Now, when we get down to the subatomic level of particle physics, we have electrons, quarks, gluons, and other exotic so-called particles. Um, and these objects, if we can call them that, can be defined only in terms of the properties they manifest and how these properties interact with other, with the properties of other uh, en uh, entities. So we know these particles by what they are like and what they do, not what they're made of. And this isn't even going far enough. We're asked to adjust our concept of the fundamental nature of reality and matter even further. We're to regard the fundamental components of physical matter, like electrons, protons, and quarks, to be composed of packets of energy and information. And sometimes that packet manifests itself physically as what we call a wave, energy carrying information through space. Or that packet manifests itself physically as a thing we call a particle, which is a set of information with its energy located in a point in space. But physicist Sean Carroll points out to the, us this point. He says it is the underlying information state that defines those properties of the wave and the particle. That's what really counts as reality. It's that information state that conveys materiality to matter. It's what makes that stuff that we call the hard stuff. So the underlying information state should be regarded as real, perhaps even more real than the properties which are manifest from us. Now this concept of matter as energy and information manifesting observable properties has parallels with the metaphysical model described by the Sankhya school of Indian philosophy. And we explored um, this model in a number of talks. Today I just can give a quick recap um, because aspects of this model are going to be useful in later talks in, uh, as we go through the universe. Now Sankhya presents a single overall reality represented here. We've got a box with this yellow outline. And that single reality is like a continuum of diverse functions and properties. So it's represented by our spectrum. First, we've got the physical stuff. That's one aspect of this continuum of reality. The physical stuff, the world around us, with all the objects that we see and study in physics and biology and chemistry and so on. This is one aspect of reality. Now, physical stuff derives its reality from the information state that specifies the various properties that this matter embodies and which it manifests and which we are then able to observe. So because there are different functions at work here, we define physical stuff in two ways. We define it has an information state we call the proto-physical qualities. That's the information which is defines the qualities, but they're not yet manifest. And then the other category is the physically observable properties, which are manifest, but they're manifest thanks to the information that is available in the protophysical qualities. So two aspects of uh, physical stuff, the underlying information state and their observable, measurable physical properties. Together, these constitute the hard stuff of physical matter. Now, although the Sankhya model defines things differently from modern physics, there are obviously clear parallels in thinking of matter in this way as energy and information. But the Sankhya system then questions, well, wait a minute, where does the underlying proto-physical state of matter, these proto-physical qualities, where does that information come from? And the answer is, it comes from another state of information that we've already discussed, something that we know is, is real and which we know is distinct from physical stuff. And that is, which we're calling cognitive stuff, the mind. We know it's real. We experience it at every moment of our waking and dreaming lives. 
The mind is an information depository of all the mental content that we uh, have. It's got all the quality related to our sensory perception. Plus, it's got all our thoughts, all our emotions, all our recollections. Now, the cognitive stuff, we cannot reduce it. We cannot find a place for the functions that are going on as the mind. We cannot find a place for them in physical stuff. Hence, we need to define the mind as a component, a separate component of reality in our model. It is, has distinct functions and has distinct properties. We know we cannot reduce them to neural and physical um, properties. So, like our understanding of matter, we can know this mental cognitive stuff only by its properties and functions. And we previously explained that within the overall aspect of mind, as a general term, the Sankhya system identifies three key sub-functions. And these are shown here, the pool of the mind, the gatekeeper of discriminative intelligence, and the persona, which is our sense of identity and selfhood. Now, these three functions of mind have great utility for psychology, and they will appear in a later talk. Hence, I'm going to mention them now, but I don't need to give any further detail at this stage. For most of our purposes, um, and certainly today, I'm going to keep it simple and refer to the cognitive stuff and all its functions as the mind. But we have to ask, is the mind itself a source of novel information? Or is it just a holder or a possessor of inf processor of information? Now, our earlier conclusion is that the mind gathers information about the world around us and converts it into a format that it then presents to us as qualia on the metaphorical screen of our awareness. So the mind itself isn't sentient. It is no experience of its own content. It serves to present mental content to the actual observer. So where is this observer? Well, for this, we need to include a conscious entity, which we have identified as the Atma. And the Atma paradigm proposes that only that which is sentient, i.e. conscious, can be a true source of novel information. All other aspects, the mind, the cognitive stuff, the physical stuff, those aspects of reality contain information and they can transfer that information between each other but they cannot generate new information. Now, this understanding can be developed into a metaphysical model explaining both perception and particularly important as we venture into part four, volition. Both perception and volition are the two key functions of consciousness. They are its inherent properties, inseparable from the nature of consciousness and the Atma. Now, for the Atma paradigm, volition is considered to be the expression of the will of the Atma to vary its experiences. And will emanating from the conscious Atma is developed within the mind as ideas, desires, plans and strategies. It's a kind of package which we're going to kind of group together and refer to as intention. Intention is a cognitive information state. It has the ability to encode and transfer that information into the physical stuff and produce manifestation. So intentional information first specifies and gives the information content of proto-physical qualities. And those proto-physical qualities are then inhered within the substrate of matter to produce the manifested physical properties. Now, our tendency is that only when we observe, or only what we observe as the manifested physical properties, that uh, is the stuff we think is real. We don't normally appreciate the subtle information processes that are going on under the surface. But the principle at work here is that the generation of information from the will of consciousness and its development by the mind into intention, which is the cognitive form of information, and then the further manifestation of the physical forms and attributes of matter, thanks to the specifying power of that information. Now, information isn't airy-fairy, according to the Sankhya model. Information has ontological status and power. It's a real factor in reality. And it's related to the three forces acting in nature. Entropy, 
which is the power of nature that increases disorder in matter. It's responsible for deterioration, decay and disintegration. But there's another power, formation. This is the power that activates matter to seemingly increase its order, to bring things together, to add additional form and structure. And there's a third, the st stasis, that power in nature which holds systems in place, that preserves order and confers balance, permanence and preservation to a system for a time. These three powers can be plotted in a kind of quasi-quantitative fashion. Um, like the three primary colours of the spectrum displayed in a triangle. And here I've added the corresponding or parallel concept um, as described in Sanskrit. Stasis as sattva, formation as rajas, and entropy as tamas. So like a colour spectrum, there are practically unlimited permutations of the mixtures of these three modes. And any particular point in the triangle is therefore a three-way coordinate defined by how much that coordinate has of the power of stasis, how much of the power of formation, and how much of the power of entropy. And I'm going to refer to this combination of the three quantities of the three modes as guna data, a very important principle for us. Since Kosankiv proposes that the combinations of guna data basically make up all the information that encodes everything that exists within the universe. So Sankhya considers it pretty important. It contains all the specifying power to manipulate matter. In the same way that a lump of clay offers potential to be molded into a huge range of objects, each with its own shape and characteristics, but it is the specifying information of the, and the input of intention and choice that collapses that potential into a specific outcome, like the vase. So intention contains specifying information, guna data, which can then act on the potential of material ingredients, like just clay. And when information acts on material ingredients, it produces the manifestation of specifically defined properties, in this case, the shape and the function of um, a vase. And this is a key principle of how the world around us operates. And nature has the material cause, and it offers us incredible potential but she allows the collapse of that potential of its of material stuff to be um, brought into a specific form to accommodate the intention of consciousness. And we saw this principle at work when we looked at life in the recent part three of our series. So having established the fundamental nature of consciousness and how it interacts and manipulates the actions and manifestations of matter, we're in a healthy position to consider what these factors might mean for biology and that incredible thing we call life. And we started by asking, well, what is life? Well, there's typical definitions that go along these sort of lines. Life is the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter. And that doesn't tell us an awful lot. And it includes the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death. So life is the stuff that an organism has before it's dead. So this tells us only what life is like and what it does. It doesn't tell us what it is. It doesn't tell us what causes it. So we went on to consider where life has come from. How did it appear on this planet? And we spent a full session on abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is um, the theory and uh, study of how the first simplest living thing came to be on this planet. Now there's no agreed idea of what that first form might have been, but it seems clear that it needed to have three components. And these three components are the various proteins and enzymes needed to handle all the metabolic functions that make the organism alive and make and help it stay alive. 
It also needs some genetic material in the form of DNA or RNA that can replicate and produce daughter cells, because if the one cell doesn't produce any more, that's the end. And it, to, in order to make sure this happens, it needed a functioning membrane to hold all the other chemicals, the genetic stuff and the proteins and enzymes and everything else that's needed to protect them. And that membrane wasn't just a simple bag. It had to have systems for allowing in nutrients and to expel waste products. Now, despite extensive research to identify how each of these elements, these components might appear on their own, we're a long way off clarifying a feasible chemical pathway to, to reach the sort of complexity that you need for any of them. And recently, biologists have recognized that there's kind of a bigger issue and that there's no value in having one of these elements without the others. So the difficulty is none of these components can produce the others without both of the other components already being in place. Now that's, a, that's a weird thing. We cannot get from genes to proteins or proteins to genes unless they both already exist within a membrane. So what we have is the ultimate chicken and egg conundrum. So the most recent idea in biology is that all three components must have formed independently of each other but at exactly the same time, or rather, despite their unstable chemical composition, being able to persist long enough, which isn't very long, to come together at the same place at the same time in just the right level of sophistication in order to produce the first living organism. With no other driving force, no other coordinating principle other than chance interactions. Now, this is a feat against extraordinary odds of what has been called by some as Goldilocks chemistry. And currently, the accepted status is that there is no standard model for abiogenesis. There isn't a consistent theory. There is no clarity on what the first living thing was, other than it might need, have needed these three components. There is no coherent, comprehensive theory for the chemical self-assembly of those components, or where it happened, or when it could have happened. So even after all the efforts to reduce the unlikeliness of self-assembly happening by chance, the odds for it happening have actually been lengthened by this current idea of everything first, because it recognizes the needs for the key components to all have been self-assembled independently and simultaneously. Now, this is not proof or evidence that life did not emerge from chemical random interactions. But what it is, is that there isn't an iota of evidence to suggest that it did. And there isn't a coherent theory to even explain how it might have happened. But the ch chance self-assembly is still an option if someone wants to continue to believe in it. And one reason for believing in it, in abiogenesis, is that it's required as kind of the starting point for the general kind of narrative of evolutionary theory. Because once you have a living thing that can replicate, then maybe from that something, there must have been, uh, you know, from something simple in life terms, organisms maybe have got more complex. And over generations, there might be small gradual modifications. And thanks to random mutations producing new features in some of those organisms, and maybe some of those features were favorable and helped an individual survive to produce more than the average of its kind, then there's a chance that these favorable genes might become more prevalent. And over lots of times, maybe colonies of a species might become separated and develop their own distinct features. Now, and that may lead to one line diverging into two distinct species lineages. Now, this narrative can really be summarized in this way. And this is the neo-Darwinian modern synthesis of evolution. It suggests that the process of modification is a gradual, incremental process that relies on occasional beneficial mutations happening to certain creatures within a group. And then natural selection, varying the prevalence, the proportionality of those 
favorable mutated genes within the population of that species. Now, we did a lot of analysis on this. This is a, 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 I'm giving a very quick summary today. But in that analysis, we showed that the process relying on natural selection and random mutations and reproductive separation may be sufficient to account for some small variation within the constraints of a single species type. But is, that process is not in any way sufficient to justify the claim of speciation, of macroevolution, that from that you have a complete divergence and a complete appearance of absolutely new novel features in various species. Hence, I suggested that the diagram should really look like this. There are hereditary processes at work. Natural selection kind of happens, but it doesn't have any information input. So these hereditary processes can produce only intra species variants, i.e. variety within its own species, but not speciation and macroevolution. Evolutionary theory contains only this one process, and at best that can produce only minor, and often if the, any changes are plastic and reversible, these only very small modifications in certain features of a species, but no new or novel feature that would characterize a different species type. So if you're interested more in that subject, I think talks 3.3 and 3.4 will be useful today. As I say, this is just a quick summary. Because really what we try to go on is to show what we can draw from the actual evidence in biology. And since the modern thesis updated Darwin's, uh, Darwin's original idea, there has been some new findings that I think require us to rethink our understanding of speciation. So from the theory of punctuated equilibrium in the late 70s, we learned that all species and groupings of species appear suddenly and fully formed within the fossil record. Now, this evidence supports the idea of punctuated appearance of species types. Then, from another group of more recent uh, biologists, the EVO-DEVO group, um, we understand that mutations play a very minor role in the variety of a species. Rather, it seems that each species type already has a comprehensive DNA toolkit capable of providing that species with a wide variety, wide range of features and mo of modifications but all within its own species type. And those modifications are not switched on and off by random mutations, but they seem to be switched on and off according to the intentions and the needs of that species. And this ties in with another set of biologists who propose um, the arrow of uh, evolution. And this updates the notion that evolution is blind and chance-driven. These biologists offer evidence that there is a link between the psychological intentional interests of members of a species and their ability to generate physiological changes even in their own lifetimes before fixing those changes in heritable DNA. But again, this is not a help to macroevolution because it simply creates variants of that one species. So these factors lead us uh, to explore uh, recent evaluation of the assumptions that have been made and prevalent on the structure of DNA um, from way back in the 1950s. So the textbooks on the modern synthesis of biology present several key assumptions, and you've probably been taught them. The first is that DNA holds all the information for the body. No, DNA is not the king. It is you can consider it to be an extensive library, but it does not hold all of the information used to specify how the cell operates. Now think of a, the use of a library. The inf there's information in the books. That's one set of the information. But in terms of the use of a library, you've also got to consider the information content in the choices that you and I might make about which books to pick, which to read, and how to use that information in the books. Similarly, DNA does not contain all the information that is used by the cell. And that's the interesting bit. 
It contains some information, but it is the cell which decides how to access that DNA library, what genes it's going to use, what genes it's going to correct, what genes it's going to modify, and how it is going to assemble what it needs from those genes. The next assumption is that DNA drives the actions of the senses. No, it doesn't. Genetic information is used to pr produce the templates for the proteins that the cell wants for its own purposes. What we see in biology is that the cell seems to be very selective, very particular in how it uses the genetic information. So rather than the DNA driving the cell, the cell is making its own decisions, if you like, or it seems to be operating in its own way to use the DNA information for its own purposes. And the third assumption is that DNA contains the blueprint of the body. And again, no, it doesn't. It's certainly not the source of specification for all aspects of the body. It produces proteins and enzymes which are useful for making certain for the cell producing certain tissues and things but it doesn't contain the specific information that determines the overall morphology of the body its overall form nor can we find in the genome the blueprint even for specific organs nor can we find the information that specifies what is happening in the coordination of the cells as they proliferate and move and specialize and differentiate and uh, during the process we call embryogenesis, the development of the embryo in the womb. So the evidence that many biologists are amassing is that we have been under an unfortunate misconception for the past 60 plus years. Biology is not a bottom-up process starting with DNA. Rather, our bodies operate as a top-down system. The cells use the genes in order to produce tissue and the reason that they produce certain types of tissue is in order to produce the specific structures of organs, which are the organs are then trying to serve the purposes of the interrelated systems that are formed, which when they work all together, they function as the entire whole organism. So there seems to be the purpose of the organism is what is feeding down into the coordination of systems, organs, tissue, and the cell's use of the DNA. It chooses what it needs in order to fulfill that function. So, this is interesting. And these biologists are saying, well, is the organism the highest level? Everything in the, um, that happens within the body down to the cellular level, to the use of DNA, is geared to uh, provide for the purposes of the organism. So, is it at the level of the organism that the template for the form of the body is to be found, if it cannot be found in the DNA itself? Well, we know that organisms are sentient life forms and that consciousness of an organism um, is a unified entity and it has the capacity for will and agency. So perhaps if consciousness is a permanent feature of life, it makes sense that the thing that exists at the overall level of the organism, that single entity, the atma, you and I, which are the controllers, the experiences of this whole body, that the atma, the consciousness, defines the purpose of the organism. And we presented evidence that consciousness could be shown in all species that we study. We considered the rapidly kind of expanding work on animal behavior that includes evidence that animals think. And that language isn't necessarily required for animals and other creatures to have effective thought. Even so, many species do appear to use various forms of language and communication, like these prairie dogs, which use nouns, verbs and adjectives in their uh, communication. And some animals are found to possess the ability of self-recognition. They know it is themselves in the mirror. Others exhibit theory of mind. They understand other creatures have minds and how those creatures might think about the things that the crow is doing. But most importantly, there is clear evidence that in all creatures that have been studied, from primates down to lower forms like crustaceans, these creatures have been shown to feel pain, not just as a reflex action, but to feel pain as being 
painful. That means that they are undergoing the internal felt experience of qualia. Pain as painful. And where there is the experience of qualia, there is consciousness. And therefore the presence of the atma as the conscious entity within that organism. So this led us to a general definition for what is a living organism as we know it on Earth. A living organism is a biological structure accommodating the experience and agency of consciousness through the faculties or, um, of a specific set of perception and action senses. And this definition can apply to any plant, animal or single cell life form. Senses and faculties are going to vary from animal to plant to bacteria, but the principle is the same for any organism. They want to experience via senses and they exercise their extent of agency to vary those experiences to make them as favorable as possible. The organism facilitates experience and agency for consciousness. So, and it does this through a particular kind of body, which has two sets of faculties, a set of senses for perception and a set, a set of faculties for action. So in effect, each organism can be defined as a particular set of perception senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting and smelling, along with a particular set of action faculties for moving and manipulating, communicating, reproducing and evacuating. And these faculties are all related to the psychological interests and intents of the mind. And together, there is a subtle state of the body, a mental concept of what it means to be that organism that would have these type of faculties. And this is an overall information form of the, all the faculties to be enjoyed by a particular creature. And it represents the objectives or purposes for its various physical organs and limbs. And we de developed our understanding of this and we presented this as the organism's subtle body. It's not the physical form we're talking about here. We're talking about an internal mental kind of state of intention and objects for, uh, to be achieved. So the subtle body, the shukshma sharira. It is the form of this subtle body that provides its organism with its morphological template. So this is that previous one, but reorganized in a kind of figurative way to show the same set of information, but specifying the location, the form, the attributes of each of the organs and limbs that that organism is going to need. You know, and this generates the entire form, the whole form, its features and its faculties, whatever that species type is. So it's laid out just figuratively here, as it might be for ourselves and maybe others in the animal world. Now, an important point to note is that there are a number of ways and many arguments of how scientists try to classify what is a species. It's not easy. And the Atma paradigm will use the term species type or guna species or sometimes this Sanskrit phrase, jiva jati, when we're talking about uh, species. And it's different. And don't think of it as a one-to-one -one relation with, to this, any standard classification definition of a species. Um, it covers a different thing. We're using a different model. But we define a species using this term um, as organisms with a common particularized set of perception senses and organ senses, and action organs rather, providing similar psychophysical agency and experience. Now, the idea of a subtle body which acts as a kind of morphological template might seem rather maybe imaginative to you, but our analysis of the biology of genetic information and other cellular activity was that neither the DNA nor the cells could account for the overall form of the body or how that form is specified during the process of embryogenesis. So we have information problems. Now the subtle body template, this concept, can help us with each of those issues. And it also suggests <clears throat> a mechanism for the appearance of species. So the individual conscious entity may hold a mental form of its body, but the Sankhya system suggests that the amalgamated group intention of innumerable 
conscious entities can conceive of a set of desired faculties that would be the basis for a species. And these kind of set of desired, these species faculties will be included within the subtle template, which exists permanently, independently of individual units of consciousness, but has been generated within the cognitive field by many, many units of consciousness. And this subtle template will then specify the form and attributes of an entire new species. It first exists as Guna data, and we've shown a, just a little grid within that triangle of the, um, uh, the three powers that we showed earlier. And we have one particular uh, little triangle highlighted in black here. So that's the particular set of Guna data that represents this species template. So a specific set of information composed of a unique combination of the three modes or powers of nature. And when that Guna data is activated and planted as seeds on the field of physical matter, that same information manifests physically observable forms and properties, which give rise to the punctuated appearance of the first population of a new species fully formed with the specific characteristics we know of um, in terms of that species type. So a very different concept of the origin of species, but one that is consistent with the evidence and the metaphysics and even the physics, as we went into in great detail. As I say, this is only a, a quick summary. But the process doesn't stop there. There's scope for further diversification within each species. So here's the principle at work. This is the close-up of our Guna triangle uh, with its grid representing all the, you know, each of those, um, the grid shows individual Guna species types. But within the one species type that we were looking at, there is a smaller Guna triangle composed of a huge range of Guna variants. And if we focus in on this one and blow it up as we do here, then each dot within it represents a more detailed combination of those three modes, and therefore a more refined specification of the Guna data for that species. But any of those dots, any of those variants of Guna data will specify forms that will still fit within the overall parameters of the data that defines that species type in terms of its perception, um, and action organs. Now, this offers the Atma a variety of forms and features and activities within one species, but in keeping with the overall faculties of those 10 senses. Now, the evidence of micro adaptation and what we see in the fossil records match this concept. A species type appears fully formed in a punctuated appearance, and it either remains the same or with some minor variation within its overall physical faculties, but there is no evidence of observed transformation of one species into another. And probably in most cases, the demand and requirement for a, spe a particular species type may necessitate the species template being activated more than once in different places. And on each, look and on each occasion, it may manifest as an already partly specialized version of the species type. So in effect, the first appearance of a population of this appearance of the species may be as a kind of variant version within the species type. And we call this a, uh, a crown variant, which is specialized for a particular climate, perhaps, or circumstance, or um, whatever is happening at the time. So a specific variant within the overall Guna species type. But from the crown variant, other variants can be devolved over time and over generations and produce subvariants. I use the word devolved because both the crown variants and their devolved subvariants are all produced from the same Guna data stock. They are, in our terms, a single species type. And Although they manifest different features and may exhibit different personality and psychology, 
They're just specialized versions evolved from the potential of the Gouda data and indeed of the genetic material of the Crown variant from which they specialized. And you can refer to talks 3.9 uh, and 3.10 for more explanation on those. So we hope that this summary gives an idea of how this model might cover not only the all the observations that are used to justify the notion of evolution, but also explain all of the anomalies that contradict evolution as a proposition. What we have just presented resolves the major issues facing physicalist and reductionist approaches to biology, how life appears from dull matter and how it proliferates into so many species. And our proposition is that each species type exists in a permanent, subtle information state. And at certain instances, that species type template is activate and generates the first population of its type, fully complete in its faculties. And how once a species makes its appearance, there is scope for variation and adaptation within the limits of the Gunadita, Gunadata species template. Now to help digest this rather novel approach to the origin of species, we gave a visual metaphor to meditate on our tree of many fruits. It's a real tree in New York State created by an artist gardener by grafting cuttings from 40 different types of stone fruit trees and he puts them together and it produces fruits from peaches to cherries to almonds to kumquats and so on. Now think of these various fruits popping out at the end of their twigs. They have an utterly different nature from the woody materials of the rest of the tree. And my analogy is that these different fruits are like individual species that appear and manifest as fully formed, each with their own distinctive forms and qualities. The fruits do not emerge or evolve from other fruits, nor are there fruits within the trunk, the branches or the twigs as they do the branching, the tree branches off. No. But in the same way that the branches and twigs of the tree provide the fundamental material and deliver the information to manifest each fruit whole and independent of each other, so we're suggesting that the underlying processes of nature provide the fundamental material and guna information to manifest each new species whole and independent of each other. And all of this kind of survey of parts one, two and three brings us to where we're going now, part four, the universe and beyond. As we said at the beginning of this session, the desire to understand the universe from our kind of parochial location on earth is as old as humanity. What's out there? How did it come to be as it is? And how do we fit into it all? But I suggest that our ability to gain comprehensive understanding that will depend on the scope of our perspective. One perspective, is that matter is the all in all and that everything, the cosmos, life and ourselves as conscious beings arises solely from bits of matter combining under the laws of physics. That we suggest is far too narrow an outlook. And we'll see in coming uh, sessions that how astrophysicists and cosmologists tell us how they're discovering all manner of new and wonderful aspects of the universe, which is true. And I'll not be challenging those discoveries, but I will be pointing out that the result of all this new knowledge is not increasing our certainty or our clarity in what the universe is or how it formed. Never mind that none of it helps us to learn who we are and how we got here. Rather, as we will analyze, the study of the universe solely from physicalist assumptions results in all sorts of quandaries, inconsistencies and even some absurdities. The Atma paradigm seeks to broaden our vision, to include the aspects of existence that physics cannot find for us. That's why our approach has been to start with the reality of consciousness. Any explanation of the universe must account for us in it, but we're going further. Through analysis, we've come to the conclusion that consciousness is a fundamental component of reality, not produced from the complexity of matter. Consciousness is as perennial as the universe itself. So might it not be a player in the unfolding of the universe? And that's why we've kind of gone into enough detail to show how consciousness enjoys its interaction with physical stuff.
The universe contains a lot of information, and we'll be questioning where that information comes from. A standard physicalist assumption would be to claim it's just a combination of chaos and interactions of fundamental properties under the laws of physics. But we have another component to add to the mix, something that the physicalist paradigm doesn't have. We have conscious agency, something we know to be true, to be real, and to be a source and generator of useful, specifying information. So will that change our calculation of what's happening in the universe and how the universe comes to have so much information? Because the interesting thing is what that information is striving to manifest. At least we know on this rocky planet we call home, you know, nature and matter seems to strive to manifest life. And biologists are struck just how quickly life seems to have appeared after Earth is supposed to have just formed from a seething hot mass. Now, we don't know what's going on in other galaxies far, far away, but there is a growing suspicion that life of all sorts pervades the universe. Is the universe's purpose then to fulfill the objectives of life, to accommodate the will of consciousness for experience and agency in whatever forms and bodies the cosmos can provide wherever it is? Now, a growing number of philosophers and scientists are starting to take this very seriously. The notion that it appears from the evidence, from the mathematics, from the, you know, all our inference, that somehow the universe has a direction to produce human intellect. And they call this the anthropic principle. It's a nice sentiment. It's got its problems. And it offers no real explanation of how or why that should be the case. The Atma paradigm offers a lot more. We're offering a model of consciousness, matter and life that defines the objectives for the cosmos to fulfill. It accounts for the specifying information, coordination, the formation and the development of universal form and the incessant drive to manifest life forms. We have a metaphysical mechanism, but it is one that's consistent with physics and biology and can explain how this all happens. So I hope that you'll keep with us as we take this trip through the universe and beyond. And we will be here next week um, uh, to look at all of these big questions of the nature of our presence within the cosmos. So 4-2 next week, a universe of information. Same time on Thursday, the 5th of November um, at uh, 6 p.m. UK time. And if you've got any questions, please do send them into info at s-pi.org. Thank you very much.